and welcome to the Disability Education and Society podcast. This is a podcast for collective learning and unlearning in the struggle for intersectional liberation. We focus on educational realms expanding to other societal areas. We share our stories as academics as well as those of our featured guests, including disability activists involved with multifaceted dimensions of systems equity, self-determination efforts, anti-ableist, and anti-racist liberation. Join us as co-conspirators. Dr. Fernanda Malinowski is a professor in the Mathematics Institute at Mato Grosso do Sul, Fardal University in Brazil. Dr. Malinowski holds a PhD in mathematics education and has an interest in research in inclusive math education, gender, racism, disabilities. Dr. Malinowski is a leader of the Mathematics Education, Diversity, and Difference Research Group. Well, we're so delighted today to have Fernanda join us on the Disability Education in Society podcast. And we're going to have um, a wonderful conversation, I feel, just uh, because of the topic and Fernanda's wonderful work. And Fernanda, you're the first person that is joining the podcast from Brazil, uh, besides me. I mean, I, I I consider myself a Brazilian because I was born there and, and moved to the United States when I was 11. So, uh, but I spent most of my life in the United States. Um, so maybe I'm not so much a Brazilian, but you are, I would say, more of a Brazilian uh, than I am, of course. Uh, and so if we will start with uh, by having you share a little bit about uh, a story that's related to uh, disability. Uh, so if you would delight us with that first of all i would like to thank you guys for inviting me to be here first i'd like to make him, my, myself description uh i'm a tall woman uh with a, a short length brow curly hair brown eyes i use glasses i'm wearing a black blouse behind me there is a paint with a ship uh, and the, now I'm in the office of my house. My story begins working with special education and people with visual impairment. Uh, I started when I was an undergrad student in Rio de Janeiro. I was living there. I, I born there. Uh, and I was a monitor in a geometry teaching laboratory in a public, a federal public university. Uh, at this time, I, uh, we held an exhibition with uh, some materials uh, about mathematics. And the, in these exhibitions appears uh, a student, a blind student. And uh, people think, oh my God, <laughs> now we don't have anything uh, about math for these students. And uh, what can we have? Uh, we can we can do. Uh, and, uh, these students uh, don't uh, uh, couldn't do anything there, and uh, it's a fail for us. And uh, my professor looked at us and said, "We need to think more about this. Uh, it's impossible for us receive uh, all." this public and uh, one student can uh, couldn't uh, take this material and uh, see all the math behind uh, these activities and uh, after that we think more about that uh, yeah. we produce low cost materials with a recycle uh, things uh, that our uh, students and the colleagues taking these houses and they come bring it to the university and uh, we think a lot about math and producing materials for all people, not only uh, blind people or uh, deaf. And uh, after that, uh, after appear uh, uh, students uh, with a visual impairment, we think more about special education. 
uh, it's a strange talk about this because the, uh, how uh, can you stay in a public university and then never think about uh, special education? Yes, uh, we produce only math. It's terrible this, but uh, in this at this time, I think it is uh, 2008, uh, we produce only materials thinking only in math and they forget the people. Uh, it's terrible, but uh, we focus only in math. And after that, we asked uh, how can we uh, be inclusive uh, and think more about it in a inclusive math education. Uh, I finished my math course and uh, I did a specialized specialization in special education and uh, my emphasis uh, is in blind people and uh, I start to uh, to write more and read more about it. and uh, I did my master's degree after that in Sao Paulo. I moved to Sao Paulo to, to uh, study more and, and, and know people that uh, study more about these uh, issues. And uh, when I was in uh, my PhD, I met I met a professor uh, from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and uh, this professor was visiting us in São Paulo, and uh, she asked more about my research. Uh, he uh, is Brazilian, but she she is like he Paulo lives in the uh, United States for a long time. And uh, she said, maybe in the United States, we can uh, talk more about this. We have professors that work with special education, and you can see more things there. And I did a part Is that Beatrice? Of yes, Beatrice. Oh, and Beatrice, she okay. passed away, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But he, uh, I studied with her, and uh, uh, she... Uh, uh, could uh, show me uh, some things, some uh, in shoes, and uh, she uh, uh, introduced me in other universities to talk more about uh, special education. And uh, in United States, for me, it was um, in, in, at this time it was um, I can I could think more about inclusive education because when I, I was in the library, I put uh, inclusive education in the search, uh, in the computer. And uh, I found a lot of uh, books about uh, uh, racism, and, uh, people uh, that people, uh, the it's exclusion process with the people uh, about the, the color, the uh, ethnic things, uh, and uh, all the things. The last one is special education. And I was thinking, why? Because here in Brazil, we think more about special education and people with disability. When I say, uh, oh, I will talk about uh, inclusive education, people think at the, fir at the first time oh, uh, this person will talk about special education. And people don't think that the, the exclusion process can happen with anyone. And uh, I now I continue my work uh, talking and thinking more uh, about inclusive education for all. And uh, I, I, like, I like to talk about special education, but it's, it's not only this. And I was talking with my students always that uh, inclusive education, we need to think more 
than uh, people with a disability. Yeah, I'm thinking about this distinction, which I think is um, here in the global north, uh, you know, United States, in Canada, United Kingdom, and I don't know, to some extent in Australia, um, people have a hard time separating special education from ideas of exclusion. Um, and I, I think what you're proposing is, is at least in the global north, I think it's a paradigm shift because it forces, um, on the one hand, a, a way to elevate the personhood of folks with disabilities. Uh, and of course, they bring with them all these intersectional things. Um, women with disabilities or um, you know, female versus male students with disabilities or different racial um, components, all the hierarchies around class, all these things come into um, every classroom, uh, whether you're talking about what they call here a self-contained special education classroom where, where only um, disabled students are, are allowed. And, and I use the word disabled um, the way people in the UK tend to use it, which is more centered on the political, the political nature of disability in the same way that race or class or gender is political because it's, it's as you say, it's about exclusion. It's, it's about um, the way we create hierarchies within education. I think it's, it's, to me, it's a very powerful way in which Global South issues could transform the way we think about special education in the Global North. Um, and of course, Paolo can say more about this um, because that, that's uh, Paolo's um, specialty. Yeah, I, I think I want to first say that I really appreciate the how you started the conversation, which was a, a visual description of yourself, and and that's something that uh, it's something we need to do more here. I mean, we we do that, but it's not very consistent. So I really appreciate that because it's a it's a good uh, signal for us uh, to provide that to folks who are engaging in the podcast. So. Thank you, Fernanda, for that. Um, and and I don't think in any of the previous episodes we have provided visual descriptions of ourselves. And so I'll, I'll do that. Uh, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, some other things. So I'm, I'm a East Asian male with short black hair. I'm wearing a great sweatshirt. Uh, my I'm in my home with my background blurred. Uh, and it's because it's it's evening here and my my place is is, is not so nice <laughs> right now. Um, and I also want to say that um, I, I'm glad you mentioned Beatrice because although I I've, I've never met Beatrice and this is Beatrice D'Ambrosio, um, Beatrice had a close relationship with uh, my uh mentor uh, when I was going to doctoral school and that was Signa Kasberg and she's at Indiana University then she was at Indiana University at Indianapolis and so Sina introduced me to Beatrice's work um, and so I, I got to know Beatrice in that way and it has it's really interesting how it kind of circles back to this conversation because you and I I have this connection from before um, that we are then bringing this work that we do with inclusive education um, and, and thinking like Alexis talked about this more uh, international way of, of how, how can we mutually benefit from that work from global North countries, global South countries, uh, scholars who are from the global South working in the global North. Um, so I, I, I really like that connection as well. Thank you. You know, it's interesting. Um, this is going to be a digression, but I think it's an important one. I I'm blind and I was born blind. Um, I grew up watching movies without the descriptive devices that blind people use now. And um, I, I, for me, all these descriptive elements are 
really foreign, even though I'm blind. And I always think about the paradox of how, for example, I as a blind person cannot describe the color of my shirt because I, I didn't ask it, so I don't know it. Um, I could describe myself as a brown older person. I'm older than both Paolo and Fernanda. And um, I have a sort of a long her, uh, uh, and uh, I don't know how much more I could say that could be descriptive enough for somebody uh, who is not seeing but needs to perceive some of these these elements. Um, so I, I find these practices interesting. Uh, I think they're a, a valuable innovation and they bring up accessibility components. But I think at the same time, they invite superficiality because some people um, think that by, by doing these, they're already um, giving up a little, a little bit of a service. And so it's, it's um, I think there's a, a bit of guilt trip in the process of just staying at the superficial level of access and not really providing um, an approach that eliminates exclusion, which is the real issue. Because when you when you talk about access superficially, you essentially try to avoid the more political, the more controversial, the more expensive components of exclusion. Uh, and sometimes the expense is, is essentially uh, bound to issues of willingness. Um, as Fernanda was saying, even without many resources, if you're really willing to include, you can you can do a lot of things creatively to make it possible. Sometimes you have a, a lot of money in your budget, but you're just not willing to go there and you just want to do uh, access, thinking of access in terms of superficial things and you pay a lot of money to your contractor um, for your website to do accessibility and this and that but it's only because of compliance uh, concerns that you want to make sure they don't sue you um, or your university or institution and that's the only concern so, I mean this is a big digression but I think it's an important example of how these these kinds of things can can work um, so um, thank you for bringing that up, Paulo. I, I think it's 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 an interesting um, element to to uh, incorporate into our podcast. Um, yeah, but and I also I, I think I want to also acknowledge what you said uh, about how it can be very superficial. Um, you know, in in that it also reminded me of these like land acknowledgments that happen often, and exactly. how exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's a good segue into the issues of, of the global south, right? Um, we, you know, we are very thankful uh, for the tribes because they gave us this land. That's not true. We took it from them and we're not giving them back uh, their land, right? It's, it's, we, we don't really want to transform the issue. The real issue is we took, we stole their land and we're using it and we will keep using it. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Uh, well, this is getting very political, Fernanda. Um, and I, I, I want to preface my next question, okay. uh, which is very political, um, by by saying, especially for people who are in the global north, a lot of our audience may be in the global south. Um, the reality of the global south is sometimes incomprehensible for people. Um, from the global north, they probably travel uh, to the global north and they um, stay in nice hotels and they go and walk and they watch what it's, it's set up for tourists to watch. Um, but they again don't have any real engagement with the complexities of what happens in the global north. So my question is connected to the issue of um, clientelism um, you, you've told us in the past um in other conversations we've had that sometimes um people in 
um, favelas especially, um, ask uh, to, to get some sort of uh, favorable treatment for certain types of um, students. That I am assuming these are students with disabilities that are already facing uh, a lot of challenges just to get through the system. Uh, so their families uh, come to you, I imagine, and um, they try to get some favorable treatment, uh, be easy on us or something. Could you describe for for audience how those interactions happen and and what what triggers those interactions? Yes, uh, here uh, we have the uh, two situations. Uh, first of them, uh, in some states, uh, in big states, we have some uh, tests. I think he, uh, in the United States, we have you have some tests. Uh, and uh, these tests, uh, people, uh, the students, uh, need to, uh, to answer about the language and the mathematics. And uh, one thing that happens here is, uh, for example, if he, I have a child with a disability, um, sometimes um, the teacher or someone uh, in the school can look my child and say, oh, uh, tomorrow we will we have a test. Uh, maybe it's not good your uh, child come because it, uh, it's so, um, maybe uh, he or she can be uh, tired because it's a long test. Um, then these large tests that we have in, in the States or uh, it's a national test, people uh, in some big States, uh, Maybe management, uh, uh, school management, school, man, oh, some words is, is teachers, uh, directors, uh, principals that you call here, uh, some coordinators can uh, receive money if the school uh, have a good grade in these tests. Then it's not good my child with disability go to school in that day. It's one thing that happened here. The second thing you mentioned the favelas. Uh, I worked in a favela in Rio de Janeiro, and uh, sometimes uh, we uh, ar I arrive uh, at school at on Monday, 7 a.m., and uh, I meet some, uh, some students hungry. And the other thing that happened here, because uh, sometimes uh, the families don't have the, uh, money or receive uh, money from uh, the government, but she use this thing in his money to pay other things and don't have the, uh, to pay food. And uh, my students arrive at school to study math because uh, they need to learn math. But uh, I need to, uh, to uh, teach how to, to divide things but my students, uh, if they, uh, all the students uh, have some problem out the school, no matter for me. This system, uh, uh, let me construct again the, the phrase. I want to, to explain that the system look my child with the person that only needs to uh, learn all things, language and math mainly because of the, these tests. But if this child arrive at school hungry, 
or with other things, other problems, uh, these systems look at the professor and said, oh, it's, it doesn't matter because it, you need to uh, teach div uh, division, uh, equations, functions, no matter if these students have a problem outside. For me, it's terrible because it, uh, I think uh, in an inclusive math education, and I, yes, I need to teach math, but I need to look that person. It's not only a number. It's not a person from favela, from other country, or a, a black students, a white students, no matter for me. I need to look at them and we like a, pers a person who needs all these basic things, food and uh, uh, some, I, I remember I bought some products of uh, to, to brush the teeth, to take a shower because it, uh, they don't need at home. They don't need, they, they don't have at home. I change the verb. They don't have at home these things. It's a base thing. And uh, the, the principal look at me and say, oh, they need to have a good grade in math because we, uh, in the other year, we don't have uh, some money to, to do things in the school. It's terrible this because when uh, we have a meeting with all professor, people look at the math professor and say, oh, this person uh, was good in math or bad. What math can uh, make it uh, construct all the future of this person? I need to produce exclusion with this guy that don't know uh, math very well. It's it's like a, um, it's like a contradiction for me. Uh, I need this guy to have a good grade to to take money for this school in the next year. I need to uh, sometimes this guy have a, five in my subject, but he, the principal look at me and say, oh, maybe you can give him, uh, give him seven because he, you need to, to pass 60% because he, uh, if you don't pass 60%, uh, we don't have some budget to another year. That's terrible for me. That's not uh, um, inclusive math. For me, uh, it's other thing. Right, it's kind of embedded in the question, but so um, it sounds like you, you see the issues of clientelism connected to um, broader dynamics of exclusion, right? Could you say, um, for now, a little bit more about when you say clientelism, what, what, what does that mean? I, I'm just to, for our audience to get a better grasp of that. Um, in Venezuela, when, um, in, in Venezuela, you would call favelas barrios. Uh, and of course, these are places where there is no running water. Um, there is no pavement in the streets. Uh, most of the places where people live, uh, th there isn't any floor of of concrete. It's it's just the the, Here's the um, earth. I mean, it's it's a, a very precarious context. And I remember in the nineteen seventies, um, the governing parties, and it, it was not done through the state. It was usually. Uh, clearly associated with a party, the one uh, with with 
the public access to public money and they they would give away um zinc which is usually what they they used to cover the roofs in these uh, places where they live um they they gave away some uh, um concrete uh, back so that they could put in you know a floor that would distinguish them from the rest of the folks in the in the ghetto um so clientelism basically creates these clients um political clients that are expected to vote for that particular party and so it it's um even now for example in in Brazil um there are these programs that give um money it's it's not a lot of money but it's it's as, as fernanda said it's money that's needed for many things uh for these people who have no other income uh, and it's money given for with the expectation that it's going to be for food but i mean these people have all kinds of needs and it it doesn't even get to to give them any real food with with the um, little subsidies that are um given it they are like little pensions for the poor uh, and they are income based it's a form of welfare but it's not a, a universal welfare sort of thing it's it's more of a way to maintain this base of of political clients so that when they go to vote they say oh such and such president gave me this money or gave me this uh whatever um so I, I think that's that's how this idea of clientelism tends tends to work in in especially in the global south. Uh, is that a good depiction, Fernanda, of what you've seen there? Yes, here we have the, uh, some things, but not not only in favelas. Uh, in favelas, we have the, the situations that I, I put for you guys because the uh, people. Um, Sometimes people receive this money from the government, but she use it in other things, maybe sometimes in alcohol uh, or other uh, things and the, the child uh, needs to go to school to receive the basic, um, the basic uh, food or uh, some... Uh, items but in this case of uh, receiving money to to uh, choose some uh, uh, president or other things happens but not only in favelas we have in a read uh, maybe uh, we have some Bibles, the Bibles. I, I don't know how to to say in in English these words. Some neighborhoods neighborhoods that not, is not poor, and the people receive some money to uh, maybe take some votes for others to the others. I don't know if it. Yeah, but purchasing good. purchasing votes. Um, yes. In... But not exclusively from favelas. Right, favelas, middle class people. Uh, yes, these. Uh, I I read some papers about the clientelism here in Brazil. There are, there is people that talk about she uh, some votes. Uh, it's it's other things, but uh, others. I think almost of them talking about she, uh, the situation that happens at school. It's the money that the school receive because the, uh, they do something. Because the, our, the public school here in Brazil receives some uh, money. It depends, depends on the number of the students. It's one thing. But you can receive a bonus uh, plus and this plus can uh, happen uh, come from these uh, grades uh, 
uh, in the these large tests and the other things uh, can uh, happen uh, this uh, uh, clientelism can happen uh, with these people uh, from favela come to a school and uh, you look all the situations in the school trying to solve these um, public problems it's not uh, these problems not the school it's not a school problem is a public problem that the governments don't uh, solve right but they come in into the classroom with the students uh, and they are exclusionary they they create um barriers for the students to be able to even engage with any any basic form of learning right i think that's that's the point that you're you're emphasizing it seems like it's all about incentives and test scores and performance and i think what you're also alluding to is there's no care about the human part of, of that equation. It's it's all about bottom line. So how long has that system, the testing regime, it sounds like, been in place there in, in Brazil? It's a long time. I don't know how long, but uh, I think that maybe these tests, because here we have a national test and uh, I, uh, states, in, in, almost of the states have a state wall test that you can uh, see the performance of the school. And uh, if the school have a good grade, receive more money to look uh, to to give the uh, a good situation for all the students, for the teachers. And uh, all people in the, com in the community, you can uh, uh, do more things uh, for that school. But uh, if you fail, you receive the, uh, little money and uh, you can uh, do the basic. Mm. Yeah, and, and Brazil is, a, is, a, is probably one of the, the few truly federal states uh, federal systems in, um, especially in South America, um, and I think it's it's interesting to see how, uh, apart from the very rich states that have their own resources, all the others, the other states have to compete for federal resources, um, and I guess for education, all these these different bonuses are just crucial to distinguish certain states from others in, in that competition process, right? Yes. Yeah, and, and I think that it, it re, I mean, it reminds me a lot of, you know, what happens here. Uh, the, you, you shared the situation in Brazil. It's It's been very similar here in the United States where uh, the accountability movements and the incentives for, you know, high, high stakes testing, scores, uh, keeping kids at home, uh, corruption. I mean, all these things have happened here in the United States as well. And so that's why I, I asked the question about um, you know, how long has that system been in place in Brazil, whether it was something that it it kind of drew on from the U.S. or something that they were doing on, on their own as well, because it, it just sounds very, yeah, very problematic and very similar to the situation here in the U.S. Hi there. While we intend to make our podcast as accessible as possible, we ask those that have the financial means to support us by subscribing as a patron to our podcast for as little as $5 a month. To subscribe, go to our website, disabilityed.podbean.com. By subscribing as a patron, you will help ensure that we can continue to create and share new episodes while supporting other co-conspirators who face financial and health difficulties. For those with financial difficulties, please connect with us about obtaining a free copy of our books and or engaging in additional conversations with us. 
You can also support the show by hitting the follow button, share this podcast with Among Your Network, and leave us a comment and positive rating. Your support means so much. Um, I, I would like to ask you, like, how would you describe, like, w- with, with all that's going on, uh, with the testing and in 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 the inclusive education? And so, how have you have you have you seen the evolution take place in Brazil over the last decades or so? Uh, education, um, it's like a paradigm, uh, and uh, we are walking slowly, but we are walking. And uh, now, uh, years ago, I think in nineties, we have uh, we are thinking all about special education, and in special education we create uh, some materials, go to school, the, look for these materials and say, oh, okay, we can test this material with the students. If that's okay, we can use on with the students with disabilities. If we have some students with disabilities, because in 90s, uh, these students uh, sometimes is at home, sometimes is in a specialized uh, institutions, but it's difficult to see uh, people with disabilities at school, a regular school. It's one point. Uh, in two thousand, two thousand uh, one two. We have the other laws, uh, new laws that she uh, say people with disabilities can uh, stay in any place, in any school. The, the old laws said this, but the new laws make Vicky uh, say you must uh, accept this uh, registration in the school because if you don't accept it then uh, you can uh, take some penalties yes uh, when uh, these laws uh, come with the uh, force force these people to put people with disabilities in a regular school, the teachers don't know uh, how to work with all these child, but at the same time, uh, all of these situations uh, oblige uh, the university, this regular school, the specialized institutions. Uh, stay together to think more about the special education and the inclusive education. And uh, think about special education uh, helps us to think more about all, inclusive all people. And uh, I think when uh, in the beginning I said, Oh, when I here in Brazil, when I I talk about inclusive education, people think about special education. I think it's because of this, uh, this beginning. Then, uh, after two thousand ten, I think uh, we are a little bit more secure with special education. We are talking more about special education in the university, uh, at school, then people now are talking more about other things and they think more about other things. And in, uh, I, I always talking about math education and uh, in math education, we start to producing materials with Create the material and the test the material and the try. I try to uh, teach Matthew with 
with this this material and Alex can look at it look and say oh I don't like this I I taste I test these I I put my hands and uh, for me don't have any meaning this thing and uh, we try again and they change the material in the beginning we did this after we uh, talking more and discussing more uh, the definition of inclusive education. And after of then the definition of inclusive math education. And a question that people always ask me and why put inclusive in math education? If you say that she, uh, if you need to put a, an a, a adjective in front of a, a math education, if you put inclusive in front of math education, what it is it meaning mean? Uh, it means that she, uh, math education don't have an uh, inclusive process inside them. And uh, people always ask me you know, why I, I always talk about the inclusive math education. I always do uh, do this because the, uh, I, I don't believe now we have a, a inclusive math. For me, uh, math is a subject that she is I don't know if it's the most excluded of the, the subjects because it, uh, for me, teach math, uh, it's uh, a contradiction of all the things that I talk about inclusive education because it, uh, it's these subjects have an abstraction and I look at my, uh, my students and I say, oh, you must do this. And if you uh, do some um, calculus and uh, all these calculus in the end have a wrong answer, I look at all of them and say, no, all of these calculus is wrong. It's impossible to do this. I need to talk with these students and look the, the wrong thing and uh, see, oh, these things you can, uh, it's right, it's right, this line is right, but in at this point, it's wrong. But you begin, your beginning, it's right. And after that, I need to see all their background to, to talk about math because they uh, see uh, math in all things, at home, in the street. Sometimes my students from favela works in uh, selling fruits or in some uh, transportations uh, in Rio de Janeiro has some uh, different transportations. Um, and uh, my students works with math every single day. And that's cool. I look at them and say, no, you don't know math because the, the math that the professors uh, is teaching there is totally different than the math that these students produce every single day. For me, it's a process of exclusion. And uh, it's for me, it's uh, difficult to talk about inclusive education or special education and say, oh, OK, I'm doing all of this well, but I'm teaching math. For me, it's a contradiction because he, um, I need to think more about this mathematics 
that we teach, we learn from the university. Now I'm teaching from my students, but he is like he, uh, a big math with uh, beautiful things behind all of these, uh, an abstraction that everyone needs, must need to know, and uh, everything we need to think more about that and talk more, uh, not, not only about uh, exclusion, p excluded people uh, with disability or immigrants or uh, black people or uh, indigenous. We need to talk uh, things that happens at school and in these subjects. I, I think what, what you're suggesting is that a mathematics education as a discipline is the one that needs to change um, so that it becomes, by definition, encompassing of all types of funds of knowledge that are already mathematical. Is, is that right? Yes, I'm defending uh, that we can include from mathematics education. And they mm. look at these uh, pure math uh, from other side, I think he, we can look at this um, math teaching or uh, the learning math. If, uh, look at this uh, math that we learn from the university, from the school, all our life. Uh, in a, in another way, uh, maybe, and producing an inclusive education and producing an inclusive math education. I do think that Alexis, there is power to to uh, Fernanda's point about being being very specific that this is inclusive math education because it is a way to signal like there's something wrong like. If you say, well, we'll transform math education, that I think to Fernanda's point, like it's very exclusionary by nature. And so there, there's power, I feel like, in, in emphasizing that we're talking about inclusive math education. And uh, Fernanda, I, I really want to point to one of the pieces you co-authored, uh, which, which you talk about this, how exclusionary math education it is. So the title of the article is published in the Mathematics Enthusiasts, uh, which for folks here in the USA, this is a, a big journal um, and, and probably throughout the world, but it's titled Exclusion and Inclusion Processes in Mathematics Classrooms, Reflections on Difference, Normality, and Cultural Issues within Three Different Contexts. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm pointing this to the audience who want to read more about Fernanda and what you stated here uh, about, how, uh, you know, math is being one of the hardest, if not the hardest one or the most exclusionary uh, content areas. And also reminded me of a work here by uh, someone who wrote about the culture of exclusion in math education and that the author's name is Nicole Louie, who is at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. So I think I, that made some connections for me as well. Um, and so I, I just wanted to say that before, you know, Alexis, you move on to your next set of questions. Yeah, I, I think this, this is it, it's really powerful. Um, uh, to think of the um, struggle that, that we're basically against a discipline that's really marked by exclusion. Um, it's almost like the um, the world of opera uh, as opposed to the rest of music. Uh, it, it's, it's like an elite sort of thing. And even though the others do music, they themselves um portray their work as as the only one that really matters the only one that has sort of the the special blessing of whatever um 
and uh, it, it also reminds me of what happened um, with English, for example. The, the way they teach English in Latin America is, is very um, disconnected from the way people really talk uh, or use English um, in whatever the United States or even um, in England or other places. Uh, because they 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 do exercises that are not really connected to um, real life English, and um, so the 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 discipline of teaching English becomes something that's creating a vacuum, uh, and in many ways, the the kind of mathematics that is is taught is designed to exclude is is basically um formulated as as a discipline that creates walls that you know blocks inside this bubble um the the ones that are supposed to be with the talent and with the special ability to be in the world of mathematics right I'm laughing because it, it, it's the the reason that my English is not good is the disconnection. Yes, but <laughs> partly because of what they teach. Yeah, they teach you all over through high school, and and you spend so many years just you know uh, this is a pen and that's a pencil and whatever, and and you say wait well, you know, what what that's not really useful for anything. Um, yes. But I think yes, this is a that form. That happened the same with math. Because right. my my students look at me and say, we need to, to know that. It's impossible to use this in the real world. <laughs> it's that, and I agree. But I can say that. Because I need to, to look at curriculum. And uh, I have a, a supervisor that she, yeah, I say you must uh look this curriculum and uh, take them and uh, uh put them in uh, the border and uh, put in, in your plan all this curriculum and uh, uh, your students need to know all these things because of the tests and uh, i need to uh, teach math because of the tests and all uh things shoes there people doesn't need to know and uh, i i can't look at them and say oh uh what you learn uh, in your streets in your house which math they uh, have there i can't do this because i need to teach the math uh, uh, which uh, can uh, appear, the questions can appear in these tests, the larger scale tests. Right. Uh, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm going to ask the same question, but in, in a different way, because I feel that in a way we're talking about epistemic violence, um, the violence of those who say they know and they impose that violence on the others who may know something about mathematics, but they are excluded because of issues of power. Um, so what, what happens when these epistemic violence encounters real physical violence, um, you know, situations where, um, you know, students are experiencing violence or there are issues of violence that are also physical and you have to deal with all those problems all those complexities of of what the students are dealing with um but you um or or anybody who's teaching mathematics for the test only are you also inflicting some form of epistemic violence um how, how would you you know, sort of think of, of mathematics in, in terms of that connection to other forms of violence that are happening in parallel 
um, to uh, the students that are you, you're working with? Um, thinking about the physical violence. No, the things that are, that happen with me at school uh, is uh, see, uh, I saw some students arriving uh, at school um, maybe happens in the in two cases happen violence at home and uh, arrive uh, in the school and uh, I need to look at this thing and uh, and think oh I'm not only a math professor I need to look uh, this violence and uh, try to to talk and uh, go to the principal and uh, look more things like a social thing that is for me more than mathematics. Uh, this is that's one point. The other point I, I talked about this. It's uh, students arriving hungry uh, in my classroom and uh, I need to look at these students and forget the math and I need to look to these students and say come with me let's go to another room and uh, let's talk a little bit and uh, I take some uh, food and uh, give to these students and uh, these things happen happened with me but uh, not with some frequency uh, happens two or three times but uh, I think it's because the uh, math professors uh, go to the school a few times because we have the, uh, a big uh, the times that we stay uh, in some classrooms, it's big, but you take only two, I don't know how to, to explain, because we have uh, many subjects, but math and language have a, a scheduling, uh, it's a bigger scheduler than other subjects. Then we take only uh, two um, class, and the other professors take five, four. And uh, I stay with few students uh, comparing with the other subjects. So people that, uh, the teachers that teach math and the Portuguese, our case here in Brazil, take less classes than other uh, subjects because the, we uh, need to uh, teach more these subjects because of the test. Then uh, we don't have the contact with the many students. I think because of this, I don't know many cases. Yeah, I think th this is, um, I mean, it's really dramatic because it sounds like it could be a, a phenomenon that's more common um but because of the nature of of mathematics you you you're also shielded from from experiencing those things more often so fernando the 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 context you're working in what it sounds like is that you are affiliated with the university, correct? And then yes. you go into the schools where- Now I'm in the university, but five years ago, I was in this school. Oh, okay. So you were in the school full time. Yes. Working yes. with students. And you said that all the students you work with are coming in from the favelas. Is that correct? Yes, because the, I work, I, I was living in a neighborhood that have five favelas near. Then uh, I, I come in for a poor place 
in Rio de Janeiro, and I worked in a poor place near my house. Now I'm living uh, in the center of Brazil, in Mato Grosso do Sul, is another state, and now I work in the university. It's other, uh, it's, it's like I stay in a favela and uh, did my master degree, my PhD, and now I'm in another uh, situation. Totally different. Now I have in a, in a good neighborhood, in another state, in a good situation. It's totally different to the place that I come. I'm also wondering, like, when, when you talked about the students you worked with that were doing all this mathematics outside of the school, and were there times when you you, you did take that up, that you did kind of bring in, as Alexis mentioned, their funds and knowledge into the mathematics classroom. So if there are, would you mind sharing some of those stories? At night here in Brazil, we have some classes uh, that we call um, NGA. Uh, it's from, uh, it's to uh, adults. Uh, I don't know in the United States if you have this. Uh, like for adult education, uh, for um, almost like GED. In Venezuela, they used to call them para sistemas, right? That the they are parallel to the educational system, but these were students who weren't able to finish their high school um, in in time, and so they have this this alternative way to get to to graduate from high school is yes, is that is that the content 15 years old and more mm, right the people can't stay uh, in the morning uh, or in the afternoon with the other students and sometimes they need to work uh, then uh, it's impossible to stay uh, in the morning and uh, in the afternoon then at night we have uh, this classroom uh, that he, I can say it's an inclusive classroom because it's people uh, that arrive uh, tired uh, from their works and uh, people who work with construction works, uh, making uh, clothes or doing cakes, making cakes and doing a lot of things. And people who works uh, in the rooms, uh, in the streets, um, is like a woman and a woman and a man who works, um, I don't know, is prostitution? Is oh, like sex a, work? Right. Yes. Okay. We have uh, all these things in these classrooms at night because these people need to study. Then uh, I, I like to talk with all these students in the beginning of uh, my class to know uh, if they like math. <laughs> Almost of them say no. And how math appear in their lives. And uh, it's good because uh, they don't know that math appear. And, and one say, oh, uh, in my work with construction, uh, I look at a, a triangle uh, with some instruments that's not usual. And uh, oh, it's good. Let's see this. And I can talk about math in looking these uh, instruments. Uh, the other uh, people say, oh, uh, I uh, make cakes or make clothes. Then uh, I can see map in, in a recipe, for example. And oh, that's good. Next class, let's see a recipe and work with this. For me, these people pass all the process of exclusion. Uh, exclu exclusion in their lives. The school excludes them after the social, the society excludes them. 
And when they arrive in my classroom at night, what can I do? Exclusion to uh, I can see uh, say oh I can also exclude because I need to to look only the pure math the natural math and don't look of this uh, the the human that she stay in front of me then for me uh, these classrooms I love I love uh, give classes for these people because the, I learn a lot from them. And I can say uh, all the power that the inclusive education have, and they can see it, that's not only for disabled people. We can include all people. Well, thank you, Fernando, so much for sharing so much today. We've gone way over time, and we apologize for that. Uh, but the conversation was so rich and and has so many great thoughts and ideas. So we want to thank you for joining us today. And just if you want to let folks know how they could connect with you, find out more about your work, um, what, what, uh, how would you like them to do that? Here in Brazil, we have a group. Uh, it's like a research group. Uh, and uh, we have our Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, it's at uh, G E G M A G. Uh, and uh, you can find us in Instagram and uh, in Google. We have uh, a website. Uh, you can write our uh, name. Uh, it's the name that uh, I spell. Uh, and after I can uh, send to Paulo our link to, to put in the podcast too. Yeah, thank you. We'll be I'll be sure to include all those information in our show notes. And again, we want to thank you, Fernanda, for joining us in this very wonderful conversation. Thank you, guys. Thank you. A pleasure. Thank you so much for engaging with the DES podcast. We post new episodes every few weeks. The DES podcast is made possible and sustainable in solidarity with you and those who generously volunteer their time to converse with us. We hope you join us on our next episode.